back to Revive School. My name is Matt Reynolds. I'm one of the team members with Time to Revive, and I serve in Ohio. You've been journeying with us through John, and today we're digging into one of my favorite chapters in the Bible, actually, John chapter 15. Uh, John 14 to 17 is, is a pretty cool section of Scripture. It's, it's one of the places that sometimes people call it the farewell discourses, and it's interesting just because it leads right up to Jesus' arrest. In John 18, that's when Jesus is betrayed and arrested and then goes to the crucifixion. And so there's lots of reasons why these chapters are important. But one of the most important reasons may be that these are the last words that we have from Jesus to the disciples right before he goes to the cross. So in my mind that says, hey, pay attention to this. So remember, uh, the theme for Revive School for the book of John is, is Son of God. And so uh, we've been talking about the very intentional way that John uh, frames his writing in order to reveal to us Jesus' divinity, that Jesus is God. And so from word one in John's gospel, he's, he's not leaving any question about who Jesus is. And today, chapter 15 is, is no different. So, in fact, uh, we've been talking about these seven I am statements revealing the divinity of Jesus. And so if you, do you remember uh, Mindy's painting and you've been looking at uh, each of these metaphors, can, uh, let's just run through some of them. Can you, can you guys remember some of the I am statements? I'm the bread of life. Bread of life. Good. What else? I'm the light of the world. Light of the world. Yeah. Any other ones? Good Tom. shepherd. Good shepherd. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Nailed it on the good shepherd. Uh, yeah, good shepherd. Uh, resurrection and the life. The way, the truth, and the life. And then, and then here's, here's where we're at today. And uh, Tom tried to jump us here a couple days ago. But we're actually here today, finally, at I Am the True Vine. Today, this is actually, this is the final I Am statement from Jesus in, in the book of John. Uh, revealing to us again Jesus as the Son of God. So let's start. Let's just dig into the chapter. We're going to start at uh, John uh, chapter 17 or chapter 15, verse 1. And I'm just going to start by reading the first 11 verses. So just hang with me. I'm going to read. There's so much in here, you guys. We can't cover it all, but at least uh, let's just read through the first 11 verses. So uh, Jesus starts out, I'm the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I'm the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he's thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown in the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. But this is my, by this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. Wow. Uh, incredible, incredible words from Jesus here in John 15. So much uh, there, but... Uh, let's just let's just dig into some of the very basics of this. Jesus starts off uh, with what's honestly in the scriptures a very famous kind of metaphor. Um, he starts off by saying these words: "I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser." Or uh, some translations would say uh, the vineyard keeper, or or it could be translated the gardener. Notice how in, in this uh, very beginning, from from word one, Jesus makes a really key distinction. What what does he say? He says, "I am the what vine, the true vine." Why, why do you think, guys, why do you think he inserts the word, not just I am the vine, why do you think he inserts the word true right here? I think he's emphasizing that he, he, he is the source of everything. So. Okay, yeah, yeah. He's saying something about the kind of vine that he is, right? Um, it's interesting, when you, when you take a look at this metaphor, this metaphor of the vine, it doesn't just show up in the New Testament. Uh, actually, this, was a, this is a prevalent metaphor because of the kind of agrarian culture that Jesus was in. Uh, there in the Middle East. But this is a, a metaphor that shows up multiple times in the Old Testament. And so for him to say, uh, I am the true vine, he's making an exclusive kind of claim. He's, 
he's making a distinction from other vines, right? To say I'm the true vine. So let's look at just a couple of the examples from the Old Testament. Go to Psalm 80. Uh, let's start at verse 8. And I just want you to see a couple of the places where the Old Testament talks about Israel as the vine, okay? Uh, Psalm 80. You brought a vine out of Egypt and you drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it. It took deep root and filled the land. The mountains were covered with its shade, the mighty cedars with its branches. It sent out its branches to the sea and its shoots to the river. Why then have you broken down its walls so that all who pass along the way pluck its fruit? The boar from the forest ravages it and all that move in the field feed on it. Now, there's some, there's some kind of challenging words there in the Psalms for Israel, but uh, I just want you to catch how uh, the psalmist uses the vine as a metaphor for God planting his seed in Israel. Uh, we see references like this in Ezekiel chapter 15 and chapter uh, 19, but then uh, one more I just want to want to turn to Jeremiah. Look at Jeremiah 2 verse 21. This is a, this is a really key verse, I think. Jeremiah chapter 2. Verse 21, yet I have planted you a choice vine. What is he talking about? He's talking about Israel here. I have planted you a choice vine, holy of pure seed. How then have you turned degenerate and become a wild vine? So you've seen just in a couple of examples there that in the Old Testament, the reference to Israel as a vine uh, many times is, is talking from a, a negative standpoint, how uh, they've strayed from the pure seed that God intended. So this is a, I just want you to think about this. Let this sink in for a minute. This is a powerful statement from Jesus when he says, with that context in mind, I am the true vine. And what is it? Who planted Jesus? Who planted Jesus, the true vine? He says it. My father is the vine dresser. He's the gardener. God, the father is the one who planted me, the true vine. Remember what's our theme in John? Son of God, showing Christ's divinity. So here, just even in verse one, we get this powerful claim from Jesus. Listen, I am the true outgrowth of the pure seed that God the Father planted in Israel. I am the fulfillment of the true vine that God intended, not the wild vine that strayed. I am the true vine. I am still part of the same plant that God started in his original plan. But this is the way the vine is supposed to look, he's saying. This is not the wild vine. This is what God intended in me. Look at me, Israel, Jesus is saying. This is what God's plan looks like when it grows in health in me. You see, uh, already in verse one, we learn that Jesus and Israel both have the same gardener. And the vine of Jesus grew out of the pure seed that God planted all the way back in Abraham. Wow, I mean, that, just that one verse to me um, is powerful, speaking to the truth of who this Jesus, who this Messiah really is. All right, look, look down now at verse 2, uh, John 15, verse 2. Here's kind of where, uh, here's where the rubber meets the road, okay? That's all well and good. He's helping, again, set his identity. Uh, John is helping us understand that so well by recording this from Jesus. But look at verse 2. Here's where it starts to get a little challenging for us, okay? Verse 2, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Now, who, who's he here? I would think the vine dresser. Yeah, the vine dresser, right? The gardener. And that's God the Father, okay? So every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, God takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he, God, prunes that it bear, might bear more fruit. Uh, he, here's the metaphor uh, that, where it really starts to, to hit home. Uh, Jesus, <laughs> he doesn't sugarcoat it at all. Every branch that does not produce fruit, God will take away. Every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will bear even more fruit. So here it is. Basically, uh, nobody's off the hook here, okay? Jesus covers uh, two different categories, and I think this hits everybody in one of these two categories, okay? First, uh, he addresses those who do not produce any fruit. Who are those people? Who would you guys, who would you say, when he says those who do not bear fruit, who would you think of when he says that? Somebody who just takes the word and doesn't do anything with it. Okay, yeah. 
But so unbelievers. A, yeah, yeah. These really, Jesus in that first part, he's addressing unbelievers, right? These are the these are the people who are not connected to the vine. How is it that they're not producing fruit? Because they're not connected to the source of fruit, which is Jesus. And so those who the first the first part here is those who are not in Christ. Those who reject or do not remain in Jesus, what's their fate? It says, well, God takes them away. If you jump down, jump down to verse 6 real quick, because uh, Jesus makes it even more clear. If, if he's not bold enough in verse 2, look what he says in verse 6, okay? If anyone does not abide in me, listen, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown in the fire, and burned. Man, like, doesn't that seem a little bit harsh to you? Holy smokes. Uh, well, I guess if they're burning, there really is smoke. But, okay, that's a bad joke. Okay, bad joke. Okay, sorry. But no, this is harsh, you guys. I mean, this is intense stuff, right? But I want you to think about it, okay? Because I don't think it's as harsh as what it sounds. Because just think about the reality of what he's saying. If Jesus is the source of life, Remember in the last chapter, John, uh, John 14, he says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, okay? If he's the source of life and you choose not to be connected to that source, you are by default choosing death. If you intentionally choose to cut yourself off from that which is the source of all life, Jesus is not being harsh here. You are sealing your own fate. You are choosing to wither and to die. It's very natural. He talks, he compares it to a natural branch, right? If, I mean, we all have branches in our yards. So hopefully our kids pick them up and we don't have to deal with them. But you know what I mean? There's, there's branches. When, when a branch falls off, it's because it's lost life from the source, right? It's, it's withered up. There's no life in it. There's no sap flowing anymore and, it, and it's died. And it's, the only thing it's really good for is kindling, right? You can use it. Uh, it becomes useful if you throw it in the fire. But there's, other than that, it's not good for anything anymore. It's not going to produce leaves. It's not going to produce fruit. It's all because it's been cut off from the life. Okay, so go back, back to verse 2, okay? So if you reject me, the first group is those who are unbelievers, those who reject Jesus. If you reject Jesus, the source of life, you wither and die. That's your choice. Look back at verse 2, though. Why does it say this in, in this way? Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Why is it that he ties in the fruit bearing here? Well, I think just really simply, um, because how do you know if a branch is still alive? How do you know that it's actually connected to the vine? Well, if it produces fruit, that's how you know it's connected. If a branch is still connected, you will see fruit. It's just like, a, you know, two plus two equals four. If it's connected, you see growth. If it's not connected, then, it, then you don't. If it's connected, the sap is still flowing. You see evidence of that life. If it's not, you don't. And I think that's just very basically what he's saying. Anyone who is not in Christ, you're not going to see the fruit of that in their life. And so they'll be thrown away because they've chosen to reject the source of life. But there's a second part in, in uh, verse 2, and I think this is important because this, this should speak to almost all of us here, okay? Because I'm assuming uh, that most of us listening to this, most of us who are engaged in Revive School, that we're probably ones who would say that we're connected with Jesus, right? Hopefully we're not in the first category who have rejected the vine altogether. We want to be connected to the source of life. I think that's, that's probably why you're doing this crazy thing and, and jumping in this school every day, right? You want this. Here's the thing, though. Listen to what it says in verse 2 uh, for us. It still says that there is cutting that comes even to those who produce fruit. There's pruning. Why? So that it will produce more fruit. Now, let me just be like kind of honest for a second. Honestly, I don't, that part doesn't sound like much fun to me. Does it sound like fun to you? I mean, what does pruning involve? It involves cutting, like literal sharp edges cutting through the actual branches. And if the disciples in this metaphor, uh, if Jesus is talking to his disciples and they are the branches in this metaphor, that means by default, as Jesus followers today, that we are the branches. That means that if we are connected to Jesus and bearing fruit, that he actually still has more pruning that he is going to do in our lives. Just because you're bearing fruit in your life doesn't mean that your pruning is done. In fact, this verse tells us you ought to expect more pruning if you're bearing fruit. 
I'm not uh, any kind of a, a gardening expert by any means. Uh, I'm much better at killing things than growing them. Uh, I mean, just like plants, okay? Just to be clear about that, just plants. Uh, but uh, good gardeners have to prune. And what is, what is the actual process of pruning? It's cutting away the dead in order to make room uh, for the new, to, to make room for new growth. It's a process, uh, actually, I was looking on some gardening websites because I'm I have no idea about this, honestly. Uh, thankfully, we're talking about Jesus and not actual gardens here. But uh, it says it's a process of increasing health and actually pruning sometimes uh, happens. People prune specifically in order to shape the plant in the way that they want. And sometimes even cutting away good limbs in order to make ro uh, room and, and help the tree to take the shape that the gardener desires. Okay? Isn't that what God does in our lives? Right? Sometimes he even cuts away good things in order to make room for even better things because he has a shape in mind for us that's better than what we can imagine. He lovingly prunes the stuff in us that maybe is not fully alive or that's taking up space so that it can provide new room for the stuff that he knows is going to shape us right into the way that he had designed us to be. Here's the problem, though. Uh, pruning hurts, doesn't it? But we believe as Christians, as followers of Jesus, that it's worth it. And catch this. You don't prune to punish. You prune to enhance and bless. You only prune what you care about. You don't care about the tree. You don't care about the plant. You just leave it alone. You only prune what you care about. That's what God does with us. Okay, back to John 15. Oh, man, we're only through two, two verses. That's great. I'm doing a great job here. Here we go. Verse three. All right. Already. Already you are clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Right? I'm not going to get into all this. There's some interesting play on words here because the word for pruning in verse two actually can be translated cleaning. And so Jesus is talking about how these disciples knew the true life already. They were already connected to the vine because of the truth that Jesus had taught them. But then skip down to verses four and five. Here's, here's kind of where I want to spend the rest of our time today. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Here's the real meat of what, what I want you to think about today. In verse four, uh, Jesus uses some key words that shape the whole rest of the passage. He says these words, abide in me. Uh, some translations say remain in me. Jesus actually goes on to use this same exact word, abide or, or remain. He uses it a total of seven times in verses 1 to 17. So I think it must be important. And here's the very basic thing that I think Jesus wants to say to us today. Remain in me if you want to bear fruit, because apart from me, you can do nothing. I think for, for much of our lives, we actually read this verse like this. For apart from me, you can do some things. Or, you know, remain in me, uh, and I'll remain in you. For apart from me, you can do well, you can do some pretty good stuff, actually. Just, just call me when things get really hard. Or sometimes I act like Jesus says, like, you know, apart from me, you can, you can do almost everything. Uh, I, I guess you're, you're just supposed to ask me for help because that's the good thing to, to do. So, but if you forget, don't worry about it. No. That's not what it says. It literally says, apart from me, you can do nothing. Friends, I think... Uh, in the Christian church, we need to get back to this place of desperation before the Lord, where we actually believe what Jesus said. We actually take him at his word, that we can't do anything, anything apart from him that has any lasting value. He's the one who provides the life in order that we might bear fruit and fruit that remains. So here's, here's kind of my big two questions, and we'll try to kind of uh, wind things down here in just a few minutes. But here's the big two questions I want you to think about just from this passage. What is this fruit that we're supposed to produce? And number two, how do we actually abide in him in order to produce that kind of fruit? So first part, what, what is this fruit that, that he's talking about? Well, if you read on a little bit further, uh, uh, look at John uh, 15. Let's start at verse seven again, okay? John 15, verse seven. If, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it'll be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. 
As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. Listen to this next part. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. So let's just stop right there for a second. As you read the rest of the passage, I don't have time to read it all for you. Uh, What Jesus starts to get into the essence of is really the essence of obedience and love. And so let me just try to sum it up for you just the best I can. What is the fruit that we are to bear? Here's the easiest way I can sum it up for you. The fruit that we are called to bear is to be like Jesus. Uh, if you look back at, at verse 8, it's, it, he links bearing fruit to proving to be my disciples. That, that verse should prick your ears from what we studied just two days ago, right? John 13, 35 says, By all this uh, people know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Then look again at verses 9 and 10. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in it. In his love. What is this saying? The Father loved me, Jesus is saying, so I loved you, now you do the same. I have kept my Father's commandments, Jesus says, now you keep my commandments. I did this with the Father, now you do this. You do the same. Uh, he, he says in a little, little bit later, greater love has no one this than to lay down your life for your friends. He says, I'm doing that for you, laying down my life for you. Now you do the same for others. The fruit that Jesus is talking about in John 15 is all about love that leads to total obedience. And really, think about it. That's the very definition of who Jesus was. Jesus was the embodiment of perfect obedience to the Father. Jesus said, I only only do what I see the Father doing, right? And so how do we bear fruit? We bear fruit when we only do what we see Jesus is doing. Fruit is Christ likeness. Remember in Galatians chapter five, man, one of the most famous uh, parts of the Bible where Paul talks about the fruit of the spirit. What does he say? The fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. What is Paul describing here? Just think about this. Sometimes, you know, we do cute series about that and talk about each one. What is he describing? He's describing the essence of Jesus' character. The fruit of the spirit is just a description of Jesus. What fruit do you bear if you remain connected to Jesus, who is the vine? Well, you become like Jesus. It it just makes sense. Think about it. When the sap of God's spirit is flowing into you, the branch, who have been grafted into God's family tree, you start bearing a resemblance to the life source. That's Jesus. Sometimes, uh, just kind of a side note, sometimes I think... In the church world, we tried to separate different kinds of fruit. Uh, some churches are all about fruit, and, and by that they mean new people coming to Christ. Like fruit is all about our witness. You know, others, uh, you know, so some people are all about that, all about our witness. Others talk about fruit, and they only mean your character, uh, your, how you're being formed as a disciple. You know, we grow mature disciples here. Honestly, let me be real with you. I don't get the separation, you guys. A mature disciple is one who shares their faith and one who shares their faith with any kind of authenticity or effectiveness will be one who's growing into the likeness of Jesus and their character, right? You cannot separate the two things. Who we are and our witness actually is the same thing. If you're walking in the spirit, growing in the likeness of Jesus, if you're you know, connected to the vine, the sap of God's spirit is flowing in you, guess what? You'll look more like Jesus. You'll be more loving. You'll be more kind and peaceful and all of those things. And guess what? In doing so, you will actually then begin to embody and to declare the good news of God's kingdom to other people. If you look like Jesus and you act like Jesus, guess what? You're going to actually want to do the things that Jesus did, which includes what? Sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with everybody that you meet. That's what Jesus did. If you grow in Christ's likeness, guess what? That impacts your witness too. So, I just don't think uh, you can split the two things apart. When we say fruit, we're talking about becoming more like Jesus, which includes our character and our witness and all of it, everything about us. Let me just kind of uh, sum up the chapter this way. Look again at verses 9 and 10. I've read this a couple of times, but I want you to hear it one more time. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. All right, I've been, I've been waiting to do this the whole time. Abiding in Jesus leads to what? Loving Jesus. 
those who love Jesus, what does it lead to? Obedience. More obedience to Jesus leads to a fruit. What do we say fruit is? Likeness of Christ. Here's a crazy guy thing, you guys. Ready? It doesn't end there. It's a cycle. When we abide in him, we learn how to love him more. When we love him more, we'll be more obedient to what he says. When we're obedient to what he says, then we start to produce fruit. And guess what? When we produce fruit, it helps us to abide in him. This is the life cycle of following Christ. How do you practically stay connected to the vine? Well, I'll just give you a couple quick things really quick. You know these already. One, you do what we're doing in this school. You stay in the word. Remember what John's gospel starts with? By saying that the son of God, Jesus, is the word made flesh. So how do you stay connected to the vine? You stay in the word because there you meet Jesus. Uh, another one, super simple, you guys, but we have to actually do it. You have to pray. How do you stay connected to any family member, any friend? You actually talk to them. How are you going to abide in Jesus? How are you going to fall more in love with him, which leads to total obedience? You actually spend time with him. If you're not spending time with him, you won't be abiding in him. Very simply, if you remain in Jesus, he will remain in you. That's what he says in his word. There's a couple interesting notes about prayer in here. I, I love this. Um, in verse 7, he says, if you do that, uh, talking about prayer, you can ask whatever you wish and it'll be done for you. You know what I think he's saying here? If, if you remain in him and, and he in you, if his life becomes more of your life, guess what? You ought to expect your prayers to be answered because you're already going to be asking from the heart of God. Because his life, the sap of the Holy Spirit, is already flowing into you. Your desires will be aligned with his desires. Uh, one last note. Uh, in verse, verse 8, I think this is important. It says, But by this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. I actually don't think fruit is the end goal, guys. God's glory is. Fruit in our lives, resembling more and more the likeness of Jesus, it just keeps pointing people back to God the Father, to God's glory. It points people to who God really is. And then he gets the worship, not us. Jesus said, I am the true vine. And if he's the real source of life, then the only thing that matters in this life is staying connected to him. If you love him, You'll do what he says. That's where the love leads to obedience. And then more and more fruit will surface in your life because you'll start looking more and more like him. That's my prayer for all of us as we travel through this school. May that be the fruit of Revive School in your life. That in the end, it's not about us, but that the fruit in our lives, the likeness of Christ that's getting embedded in our lives as we dwell in his word, that it would keep pointing more and more people to the Father and he would receive the glory.